uh, hey, fellas. Hey, we're live. Oh, hi. Hi. Nice. We're, we're live. <laughs> Hello. You may have heard the end of Keith Hernandez's story right there, <laughs> that he's been up since 4 a.m. Are you going to bring the energy, though, Keith? Did you get I've a nap got it. at least? No, right, good. Keith, Keith, the, force way, is with, his, the force is with me. Sporting, <laughs> sporting his baby Yoda hat for our first Beyond the Booth. I just, I, I, just, I just want everybody to know that before we started, about 30 seconds before we started this Facebook Live event, Keith let out the biggest sigh. It was like it was the 18th inning. I've been up for 12 hours. <laughs> well, my favorite part of the whole thing is that we were told, okay, in 30 seconds, you'll be live. So just hold on a second. And we got maybe 15 seconds before we all started talking again. <laughs> That's great. All right, so. This is going to be every Thursday, 4 p.m. Uh, Gary, Keith, Ron, myself, Steve Gales will join you live on Facebook. Today we're going to be taking your questions, so start sending them in. Obviously, we would much rather be in Washington right now. Uh, this would have been the Nats home opener today, but, um, but this is, I guess, the next best thing. Just, just glad to all be together again. Uh, let's get it out of the way first and foremost, obviously, from all of us to you. We hope you're staying safe. Thanks, smart, and uh, and hopefully we'll be back calling baseball soon enough. But guys, um, let's just kind of go one at a time here. Since we are doing this virtually, I'll, I'll direct it one by one. We'll go in order here. Gary, first of all, how, how have you been? Have you been holding up during this this very unusual, uncertain time? Um, you know, I just – it's almost hard to express what this feels like, not personally, but in, in terms of what's going on um, in, in our – city um obviously it's everywhere across the country but the scenes from inside the hospitals and and just the the feeling of of what has 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 hit us is so overwhelming um you know we're all comfortable and and we have everything that we need but there's so many people suffering and so many doctors and nurses and everybody else in the hospitals working so hard to try and do whatever they can for people who are suffering and and your heart just goes out to everybody um, every minute of the day. And, and that's really where my focus has been. And it's, it's hard to get away from it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's moments like this and, and situations like this, that they just, they snap you right back to reality and, and put so many things into perspective and give us a new appreciation. I think as if we, we needed it, but uh, for what we do on a daily basis and, and how lucky we really are. Keith, uh, I'll pinball it over to you in your uh, in your office over there. The Willie Mays picture in the background, baby. Yes. Hat. We've checked in a little bit already. We know you're working on that 2000 piece puzzle, yes. grinding away. How are you and, and how is Haji? Haji's great. He's right here uh, sleeping. Uh, he has no worries. He gets fed and uh, cleaned up after and gets all the loving. Uh, I've been fine down here. I never left Florida. Uh, as you know, this all came about in spring training, and <clears throat> so I never went back up, uh, stayed down here, and uh, I'm grateful for that. Uh, like Much like Gary, um, I heeded the warnings early and provisioned mm -hmm. up. I uh, actually you know, bought a, a second refrigerator that was on sale, a cheap refrigerator just to have more storage for food. Um, again... <clears throat> I'll reiterate with Gary, all the people up there in New York, where our hearts are with you. And um, we've all got friends there. Uh, I've got some doctor friends that are working uh, in, that are working up there doing the, the good deeds, putting their life on the line, really. And uh, it's just incredible uh, what's going on up there and around our country. But uh, I'm fine right here. Um, I don't need to be entertained. Uh, I got books. I've got a crossword. I mean, a jigsaw puzzle. I've been doing crossword puzzles again, Ron. Yeah, geez. New York Times crossword puzzles. So <laughs> on a daily basis. So all good. Ronnie, what about you? Um, I, I, with Gary and Keith, you know, um, I know there's so much utter despair uh, out there. And, uh, and my thoughts are with uh, those people are doing the most. You know, I think we live in such a celebrity culture. We're told so many times who the most important people in the world are, and they happen not to be. Uh, it's the people that are on the front lines that are trying to keep us safe, keep us alive. Um, my hat is off to them. Um, uh, boy, I, I mean, I, 
have a love for these people uh, that are risking their lives every single day on a, on a personal level. Um, I am in Florida also. I never left spring training because I have three senior citizens with me, including my, both my parents. Um, and, you know, they're compromised. Their health is compromised if they were to catch this corona. So uh, we have been uh, quarantined um, to the best that we can, you know, other than a walk or two outside and this or that um, since the middle of March. So, uh, um, you know, knock on wood, all I care about um, right now per, on a personal level is just to keep my parents safe and healthy and to not contract the virus so that uh, they can uh, live as long as they, they're supposed to. And guys, just to, to button this part of the conversation up, just on a personal level, what we're talking about with regards to the, the healthcare professionals and the amazing work that they're doing, my brother is a doctor on Long Island. And you know, the stories you hear and the stories I hear talking to him, the amazing thing with these doctors, with a lot of them that I've heard about, including my brother, he got sick the other day and thought, you know, maybe he might have it. Uh, thank God he tested negative for it. But in my conversations with him, it wasn't about worry for himself that he may have the virus. It was worry and, and being upset about the fact that he couldn't go back into the hospital in the meantime to help out. And that's what it sounds like most of the, the thoughts are from a lot of his friends who are also doing the same thing. So again, these are the true heroes. And from all of us, we, we express such incredible gratitude uh, for what everybody out there who, who's watching right now um, is doing because it's, it's remarkable, remarkable stuff. Um, guys, let's, uh, let's move on to some baseball stuff though now. And like I said, we are taking questions. So if you're watching us now live on Facebook, send these questions in. We have a producer back in New York who's going to text me these questions. But we did get a couple using the hashtag AskGKR uh, in the last couple of days leading up to this live stream. And I thought considering the fact that now with no sports, it, it feels like the nostalgia is exploding and all these old events are, are coming out. I thought a good one to start with would be from Nick Coco 18 on Twitter, who asked what was the favorite game that the three of you have called together? And I guess, I don't know if it, it's going to be the same one, but, um, but let's, you know, Ron, let's start off with you. What, what was the favorite game mm. that you've had in the last 15 years calling for SNY? You know, um, Steve, what we do, uh, sometimes some of the favorite games are really some of the subtle ones that uh, uh, probably bemuse us at the end of the day, uh, whether it's uh, how do we get through that open? Um, how do we get through that inning? Um, what a special play or, or you know, it's, it's, it's just... It, uh, but for, for us as a group, I, I would have to say, just because of the history of the New York Mets, I think uh, being able to be at the game all together, because, you know, we don't do all the games as a three-man booth. So to be all together, a three-man booth on June 1st to watch uh, Johan Santana throw his no-hitter, to me, um, you know, historical games are the games that you want to do. That's why I still am a fan of extra innings. That puts me in a minority, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, I, I think that game, with all of its nuances and the, and the Beltron hit and non-hit and the Mike Baxter catch, um, all of those things made that, to me, um, I'll never forget that game. And I think that's, uh, that, that will last forever. Gary, what about you? Well, I would, that was going to be the first game that, that I would have um, cited because, I mean, let's face it, um, and I've said this before, until the moment that David Freeze swung at that last changeup, I didn't think that it was going to happen. And, you know, having been a fan of the team since the early days, I expected that it was never going to happen. And, um, you know, the thing that I would add to, to Ronnie's recollections of that game, and it, it was such a an enormous storyline through the entire night was the anguish of Terry Collins and the way that um, we watched him inning after inning almost collapse into himself because of his anguish at sending Johan Santana, who he knew was in jeopardy because of his injury history, back out there inning after inning. The other game, and it really was more a series than a game, 
that um, that always mm -hmm. lives with me is um, in 2015, the series in Washington in early September um, when the Mets pulled away. Um, just a remarkable three-game series with Cespedes and his heroics and Kirk Neuenheis. And um, it was just, there were so many things about that series they came from behind in every game and um you know that was an unexpected championship year for, for this franchise and, and i know they fell short in the world series but um to think that the same team that was languishing at the end of july before the trading deadline could get this incredible rejuvenation and spark of energy and come back and and get to the world series and that was that was the series that really solidified it. And it was so much fun for all three of those days. Keith. Oh, <clears throat> obviously the no hitter. You remember the historic ones. And I remember uh, I'm like Gary, you know, how many times have we gone? Well, not a whole lot, but you, you're in the seventh inning. You still got to get nine outs and you, know, you get to the eighth inning. You got to get six outs and you get to the ninth inning and you got to get a pressurized three outs. And I just, was saying, when is the, when's the shoe going to drop? The other shoe going to drop here. And like Gary, uh, when he got the final out, and I think what happened, I made a decided effort uh, in the broadcast <clears throat> that this was a pitcher's game as the story started developing. And okay, I let Ronnie, I pretty much went into the sidelines and let Ronnie do most of the of the, of the analysis because this was Ronnie's field. It was a pitcher's game. And, you know, when it was finally uh, over with, I, I think someone had to pinch me to really realize that the no hitter was there. And uh, it was much like when you're talking, Gary, about uh, Santana. He got tired and it made his change up better. It was very similar. You remember when John Smoltz got put back in the starting rotation and pitched against the Mets and had all those strikeouts? And it was in Atlanta. Was it in Atlanta? Yeah, first week of the season. Yeah. yeah. And Bobby Cox did not want to leave him in for nine, but he had that chance to get uh, the strikeouts and he was pitching a brilliant game and he blew up late, but there was a power pitcher where Santana had the changeup. And like Ronnie said, and Ronnie's always said in the broadcast, sinker ball pitcher, when he gets tired, his sinker gets better. Uh, so I think that Santana got more effective the last three innings of that game. Uh, because his changeup just started dropping off the off of a table. Uh, as far as one game that I, re that I remember besides, and only because of the frustration of this game, it was Gary and I in St. Louis, that extra inning game. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that one. Well. Winner. <laughs> what were the Mets? One for 24 of men in scoring position? Yeah. And it was so frustrating that game, and it went so long. And remember, we had the woman who was out in the bleachers in the end, and she was laying down. She was out like a light. <laughs> but the frustration of I was a hitter, and I've never been on a team. I've been on teams where you have a game where you don't, but I've never seen anything remotely close to the futility of the Mets trying to hit that game with men on base. It was extraordinary. Now, the fact that it won extra innings and then – the cherry on top when the game was over, and Gary probably won't remember this. It was a long game, and, I think it was and they won. Away. And they won. Was, they they won. won. And it was a getaway day, I believe. And Gary said, "We went off the air." Gary said, "Good job. You were from first inning to the last. You were spot on." And that meant that meant a lot to me. This is from Gilberto J six one five on Twitter, who wanted to know who was the toughest pitcher that you ever faced in your career. Oh boy. Well. There was a lot of them. Uh, I never liked a left-hander that could pitch inside and had a hard sinker. And ironically, um, I had a, I went to a, a baseball writer's dinner when I was a Met and sat next to Joe DiMaggio on the dais. And Joe turned to me and said, what pitch don't you like to hit? And I said, uh, well, I don't like a really good curveball. And he goes, curveball, curveballs are, are meat. We I mean, didn't say meat. He goes, I go, well, what, did, what didn't you, what, what did you not like, Joe? And Joe said, I didn't like that right-hander that had a hard sinker. He goes, it would get under your bat. So Zane Smith was one of them, Ron, had a hard mm. sinker. Uh, Atlee Hammaker. But to me, 
uh, uh, Don Sutton was such a, a master. Um, he had five pitches, plus he had a razor blade. And uh, he had a, one of the great curveballs. And when a guy has a great curveball, throws it with velocity, it's like triple exposure. And my, it was a ball breaks. Uh, it's like a comet. The very few guys had that. Not even, like I can say, less than 10 in my career. And that's a pitch I didn't, I didn't want to hit. And he also had a turnover screwball that he can put knee high outside corner, three and one, two and oh, any situation late in the game. Never made a mistake. I knew he was going to throw it. And I was waiting on it. And I was waiting for him to make a mistake over the middle. And he had son of a gun. He never made a mistake. <laughs> Always on the black knee high. And he had a cutter inside, which was his razor blade ball. And he pitched in and he had a real herky jerky motion. He was just Ronnie, Ronnie will tell you, Gary. He was just an artist. He's in the Hall of Fame. This is just like the actual broadcast. Keith, you're taking hitting. Ron will go to you for pitching. Okay. A question from uh, Frankie Acevedo. It's about this year's team with Cindergard now down for the count. Which pitcher? do you think will step up most in his absence when eventually this thing starts back up? Well, we're going to eliminate DeGrom, right? I mean, cause he steps up every day. So, <laughs> huh. or every fifth day. So we'll eliminate Jacob. Um, but when I look at the staff and uh, you know, with the new additions, of course you have Stroman who was over for a half a year last year. Of course you've got Porcello and Walker. Um, I, I'm going to go with, uh, you know, not the favorite. I'm going to go with a dark horse, I think. I think Michael Walker is going to have a, a, a great year. I think that, you know, when we left spring training, there was a really good chance that he was definitely not going to be in the rotation and pitch sparingly out of the bullpen. But now he's going to get his chance uh, to make as many starts as he wants. And uh, Gary and I talk about this all the time. I don't think he did the game, but in spring training of 2013, I think the year was. I was uh, there. Mike, Mike, oh, you were there, Keith. And Michael mm -hmm. Walker came. Uh, whatever the ballpark in, in Port St. Lucie was called at that time, he came out <laughs> on the mound. And uh, I had never seen dominance like that in quite some time. And, uh, of course, you know, he was amazing his first year uh, in the playoffs in 2013. It's the LCS MVP, right? That's right. So I, I think that uh, Walker is going to be the guy that surprises us the most. Ronnie, is the key for him just going to be, aside from staying healthy, obviously, yeah. making sure that velocity uptick that we saw a little bit this spring, he can maintain that so he has the, the velo difference between that fastball and the changeup? I, I don't think it's really the velocity. I think the velocity is not going to be what it was once, when he threw 95 plus. It's going to be less than that. His, his, to me, when I watched him pitch the last couple of years, his ability to throw his breaking ball for a strike when he needs to, uh, to get him back in counts, which will allow him to throw his best pitch, which is his changeup. Uh, changeup down, fastball up, uh, works in today's game. Gary, this is kind of a cool one from Met News 2 on Twitter. Wants to know, in all your years broadcasting, what is your favorite home run call? Wow. Um, you know, there have obviously been a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 you know there there are the ones that have great meaning um globally and then there are the ones that that come out of nowhere um you know the 1999 postseason was I've, i always told people that was um that year was my my favorite year broadcasting the mets because you know i arrived in 1989 and Mets were coming off the greatest four-year stretch in their history which these guys were a part of and then I arrived and there was a 10 year drought. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Don't take it personally, Gary. <laughs> not, not that I did. A, a lot of people might have, you know, associated me with, with that drought. But Gary, anyway, Gary, oh, excuse me. It was a six year run. <laughs> no, but, 84 but 80, to 89. 80, <laughs> well, let's just say 89 was not a great year. No, Keith. No. That was my first year. So anyway. Um, so when 99 arrived and the Mets finally made it to the postseason, and it was it was a, a fabulous year just in terms of the personalities and, and the uh, the comfort behind wins and and, and all that. Um, so when they got to the postseason, that was my first postseason in the big leagues in my 11th year. 
Um, so I had, a chance, I had a chance to call the Todd Pratt home run against the Diamondbacks. I had a chance to call the, the Ventura Grand Slam single against the Braves. So mm. those were those were the, the, the biggest calls that I that I got to have. But you know, the Bartolo home run <laughs> in San Diego, and I've said this to other people, you know, there are things that you can prepare for. Um, when you're a broadcast, somebody's about to reach a milestone. It's a big moment in a game. You know, you're 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 ready for those moments. There are certain things that come out of absolute ether, and that that was the case with Bartol. And and Ronnie was there. He he knows exactly how it felt. It was like, oh my God, this thing just happened. How do you possibly react to it? And um, so that was that was really cool. That one was something special. Uh, this Ron Keith. Either one of you can take this one just from a, a former player's perspective. Uh, I guess I guess I have to say, one of you raise your hands right now. Who wants it? Keith's got it. Keith's got it. <laughs> I got nobody raising their hands. Uh, will it be hard? <laughs> will it be hard? Guys, we're on our first Facebook Live here. Let's get a little more enthusiasm. Uh, will, it be, will, will it be hard for the players to stay in baseball shape the longer this goes on? Oh, I think undoubtedly. I mean, they have such great training regimen now. Uh, if our generation or before us, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Well, remember the strike year in 81, uh, I didn't do anything in the strike in between. That was At that point was the longest uh, strike uh, interruption of play in, in professional sports. Um, that was a long time. We had the split season. <clears throat> They're going to have to play some spring training games. I mean, and the pitchers, they can't, the starting pitchers, they can't uh, pitch every day. They got to, you got to pitch all five of your starters. Hey, Ronnie, you were involved in 95, yeah. right? Where, where they had the replacement players. And then when the, the real players came back, you had a three week spring training. So, so how did you guys prepare for that? You know, I, I was, uh, happened to stay in great shape that year because I stayed in St. Lucie and, played basketball three hours a day. Uh, so that's how I kept my conditioning up. Um, my opinion, today's athlete in baseball is, uh, is an amazing shape. I think surprisingly, they're going to su sorry surprise you uh, by being in shape very quick. I think two to three weeks, they're going to be ready to go. The only issue I see is the residual injuries that might happen after that initial start period. But I think two to three weeks, these guys are going to be ready to go and play games. Right. Certainly, um, you know, with starting pitching, uh, you know, it might be a 75 pitch limit uh, the first couple weeks, yeah. the first month of the season. Uh, but after that, I think it's just really the injuries that might happen. But they'll be ready to go quickly if that comes to pass. Ronnie, lot. even if they're – sorry, yeah. what were you saying, Keith? No, Even there's, if gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of double headers, make up yeah. double headers. Yeah. It's gonna put a strain on the bullpen. Uh, I'm sure uh, I'm sure they're going to expand the rosters even yeah, beyond the 20. I would think so. I would think so. Even if these guys are able to stay in relatively good physical condition, though, with how unique this situation is, the inability to really hit from a hitter's perspective, to see live pitching, how much time do you think it will be before the the baseball product has ramped up to what we're used to seeing well you know, one steve i think because of what we're going through you know uh, i don't think anyone is going to when baseball starts when it starts hopefully it starts when everyone's safe but when it starts no one's going to have any uh i think opinions about boy i don't feel 100 percent or any of those or shame on them if they do um, I, I think that uh, the the ultimate baseball product will take some time. I would think, uh, you know, a, a couple of weeks to, to a month of play. Um, but um, no one has been through this. Uh, no one knows. They don't. I don't. You don't. Um, so, you know, what what you're going to see, though, is 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 I think um, the amazing thing about professional athletes, uh, baseball players and what they can do. Uh, when they're asked uh, to get the product ready in a quick amount of time. You'll, you'll be very, very surprised. I think it'll give new thought um, to how spring training is conducted uh, in the years to come because of how quickly these guys will be ready to play. And I think the other interesting thing, depending on when we start, um, you know, if it's a later start, say, 
say um, we can't get spring training going until August and we can't start the season until September. And even if we play two months, um, September and October, and then play the postseason in November, and you have basically a 60 game sprint. I mean, that completely changes the way that you play every game where, yeah. you know, you can't let anything go. Every game becomes so much more vital right from the first day of the season. And I think that's going to affect the, how the game is played as that's well. Right. That's right. I have a question. Sorry, Steve, for Ron. Yeah. You know, normally you go to spring training, pitchers are ahead of the hitters. I think this time around when the players come back, I think the hitters are going to be ahead of the pitchers because you can, you can have your sides, but there's nothing like going out there and pitching a ball game. The hitters can take BP and be pretty much in tune, ready to go when the season starts. What do you think, Ron? I, I totally agree. I think, I think the pitchers will be uh, behind, but how they'll hide that, Keith, is that with the expanded rosters, maybe even to 30 players, uh, what's going to be the difficult thing for the hitters is that you might see seven pitchers, eight pitchers per game. That's going to change it for uh, the, the everyday player. So, fellas, last year, Pete Alonzo burst onto the scene, one of the great rookie seasons of all time. But from our perspective, I know from everybody's perspective, they saw this, but really being around him on a daily basis, seeing him behind the scenes, what was striking was how much of a leader he became so quickly in that room, uh, how much of a responsibility he took being a, a face of the team, being a part of the fabric of this city. And so Cameron asked the question, I know it's a little bit, uh, a little bit crazy in, in some people's minds this year too, but Gary, Cameron wants to know, should the Mets consider making Alonzo the captain? Well, not right now. I mean, that can yeah. certainly happen. I mean, before David Wright was named captain, there was probably a three, four year span where people asked that question, right? We know he's going to be the captain eventually. Is David Wright going to become the captain? And then it eventually happened when, when it, was, it was time. I, I don't think a second year player is going to be a captain, but, you know, Keith can speak to this better. I, I think it's, it, it's bound to happen somewhere down the road. Well, I just think, uh, you know, baseball is not like hockey where you got the, you know, you got the C <clears throat> on your uniform. Uh, it's, you don't really have to name a captain. It's, it's pretty much, uh, you know, unwritten. Everybody knows who the leader of the team is. Uh, and it's something that as a player, you have to embrace. You have to want to do that, to do the things, uh, you know, care about your teammates and go the extra mile as just as, instead of just performance on the field. Um, I think uh, that Pete has just embraced it. Uh, you see what he does uh, in the community. He's just one of these special guys. He's like the second David Wright. And David Wright, I was always worried about David doing so much activity off the field. Uh, it was extraordinary what he what he did, and then being able to play, and I was always worried is it going to wear him out in August and September when we're going to need him, uh, but you know, Pete is as it has embraced this, and I it's genuine. There's nothing fake mm -hmm. about him. It's just who he is, and I just think he's really uh, an extraordinary young man. You know, Steve, to add my my little bits to it, I, I think that it's very difficult for a young player to um. Uh, that kind of focal point for a ball club. But because of the emergence of the young player on this New York Mets club and how much uh, they ran um, to this team moving forward, um, I think there was a vacuum in the house uh, for someone to come forward. And very rarely um, player do it, but I think Pete not only represents and captain qualities, but I think he also represents the new wave of the young players on the Mets that are so fun to watch them into. And uh, one of those new young players is a guy that's essentially blocked by Pete Alonzo. That's Dom Smith. We have a question about him, but I do want to reiterate for everybody out there watching right now, we're taking your questions live. Keep sending them in. We have a producer back in New York who's going to continue to text them to me. But Ben wants to know about Dom Smith and what his role on this team is going to be moving forward, Gary. It's a really good question, and that doesn't only depend on 
Dom, it also depends on the availability of UN Cespedes. And, you know, the later we go into the summer to start the season, the more likely it is that Cespedes might be ready to play a key role early. And if you've got Cespedes and you've got uh, J.D. Davis, um, it's hard to see playing time for Dom Smith emerging really at any point, even with the flexibility the Mets have with you know, moving Davis to third and moving McNeil to second, it's, it's going to create, create quite a quandary. Um, and you have to wonder whether, and we've been wondering this for months, whether Dom might be involved in a trade at some point. It's great to have depth, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be an interesting question, at least for this year, because, you know, once you get past 2020 and then Cespedes becomes a free agent again, that changes the equation. And so, you know, so much of it depends on what nature this season takes and, you know, how long the season is and when it starts and if it starts. And, um, and, and that'll affect that, that question as well. You know, guys, I had a long conversation with Dom Smith this spring, and this was actually one of the things that I was going to do on the broadcast really this season, but I'll, I'll put it out there now. You know, I asked him point blank about his situation and, and, if he even wanted to be traded at this point, because it would open up some playing time for him. And he was so genuine in, in his love for the city and this team. And he said that there was a conversation he had had last spring and he couldn't remember exactly who it was with, but the words he said really spoke to him where somebody, he said, I thought it was a coach said, do you know how many people dream about being here and dream about playing in the major league? There are so few people that ever play in the major league you're living out that dream and in addition to living out that dream because of your role right now on the team every at bat you get for the most part is going to be a major at bat it's going to be a really important at bat and he said once he adjusted his mindset to that he fully embraced this role and i don't think mm -hmm. anybody questioned what we saw last year in terms of it being genuine from him how supportive he was of pete how supportive he was of his teammates but he truly does love being on this team and welcome the role that he plays on the team. And so, uh, again, that doesn't mean that, that the role is going to be like this forever and he may indeed get traded. But uh, I think it's one of the, the many reasons why the fan base has fallen back in love with Dom Smith is the way he was last year through the injury and, and through his limited playing time. My, my, only, uh, my only point to that would be um, stay greedy, Dom. Um, I think it's really nice to, and I think it's a great thing to be as a great teammate, but uh, stay greedy. Every player wants to be an everyday player and um, you know, roles are nice. And uh, that's uh, certain teams. Those are roles that you're in. And uh, listen, no one loves Dom Smith more than I do. I just uh, think he's gone through a lot in his young career and he's handled it um, uh, really in, in, uh, in great ways. But stay greedy. Want to be an everyday player, in my opinion. I I agree a hundred percent. I my intent was to be a major league player, an everyday player, not just a good player. I wanted to be a, a great player, a, a, the best player I could possibly be. I wanted to be a star. It is extraordinary that, and it's I think it's indicative of this whole team mm. is that everybody uh accepts their role you got a lot of young players usually when i played and, and ronnie played and before us it was the veteran that was the bench player it's the toughest job in baseball uh and you're, you're you've had a career as a starter and then you go to the bench and you're still in the big leagues and you're mature enough to handle it young players are always chomping at the bit they want to get out of the barn and just gallop and uh it, it's tough to you know, get in, you may not get into bed for four days and then you're going to be put in a spot in the eighth inning with the game on the line. It's a, it's not an easy job. It's not an easy job. And that's what made what he did last year. So impressive. What Nimmo did the last couple of seasons when he was asked to be in that role, the, these young players coming through the way that they, they JD, have. And JD as well. Yes. yes. Well, yes. speaking of JD, Gary, let's, let's stick with you on that one. This is from Brian. After J.D. burst onto the scene last year, what are your expectations for him this season? I mean, the sky is the limit. I mean, we, I think we were all surprised at what J.D. brought to the table and the consistency that he showed across every role that he was asked to play, right? Because he had 
parts of the season where he was playing full time. There were parts of the play of the season where he was getting three at bats a week and he was able to handle them all. And I was blown away, um, not only by um, his performance, but by his understanding of his his ability and and uh, embracing the analytics and, and and everything that he brought to the table, his personality as well. But but I mean, I, I don't know what this guy is capable of, I, I, but I think that he has a chance to be a, a real mm -hmm. star. I mean, we've seen the emergence of, of Alonzo and McNeil as all-stars. There's no reason to think that J.D. Davis can't be an all-star as well. Ron, what about Rosario? Now, Rosario uh, has been kind of an enigma at times, but the way that he put things together in the second half, if that was a, a sign of things to come, I mean, this team is so much more better for it. And so that was the question from, um, from Howard. Do you think Rosario will, will kick it into gear all the way through this season? I think I had some, uh, some stat on him. I, I can't remember it, uh, so someone will call me out on it. But I, I think his last 40 games on the road or something hit 380. Um, the, the great thing about Rosario is, uh, and the most difficult part, is that when you come up as kind of uh, the number one prospect for a team, in today's game, we expect uh, Francisco Lindor. We expect, uh, we expect uh, Mike Trout. We expect players that are just going to be ready to go. And there's always going to be guys that are going to take a little more time than others. Uh, but his year last year was second to none. I think he has solidified himself. If he's not a top-tier shortstop, and I'm talking about Lindor's and Correa when he's healthy, those young shortstops, he's just in the next tier. And I think that's a, um, that, that's a great testament to the hard work um, uh, of um, Ahmad, uh, Ahmed. It's just that he's been um, er everything that you'd want, he has become. And uh, he's only looks like from us watching him last year, and I don't think the guys disagree, it's only going to get better. Um, you know, he, to me, he had just figured out how to play the game around his skill set. And um, uh, with, with the occasional pop, the ability to go the other way, using the whole field, the hustle, the being ready for his shortstop position defensively. I mean, every box you can just check off that he um, succeeded at last year. And I think there's a, there's a higher ceiling for him, in my opinion. And he wants to be great. You know, I, I spoke to him this spring and I asked him if during his early struggles, if anybody ever said to him, you know, take it easy on yourself. You're still so young. And he said they did, but he actually hated it when people would say that to him because he thought that mentality, believing that you're young, kind of takes you off the hook in your own mind. And he didn't want to be taken off the hook. He wanted to, to live up to those expectations. You know, so, I, I, I told the guys this story many times. I had a, a young manager, a young pitching coach who uh, I'd had a few bad starts in a row and I told him hey you know uh, you know I'm not panicked I I'm good I'm not panicked and he said well, well maybe you should <laughs> and sometimes uh, sometimes it's good to put a, a lot of uh, a pressure on yourself you'll be um, it it'll be interesting to see how you respond so Keith speaking of pressure not to put too much pressure on you to, to bring him to the forefront right now but apparently like every other question we're getting right now is where is Haji so where is he? Where Hodge? There he is. He's been sleeping. There you go. Oh, he's been mad. I woke him up. Hi. <laughs> there he is. He looks like me around three o'clock in the morning after a after a, a night game or the day game the next day. <laughs> Wake up, pal. By the way, now we know who's the real Tiger King. I mean, he looks just like Joe Exotic there. <laughs> That's How is guy. Keith not watched that? <laughs> How is Keith not watched it? Uh, Keith, while we have you and Haji, there were there was a run on on questions just about what you've got going on in your apartment right now. So uh, Jabour wants to know if you've read all those books behind you. Uh, no, I've read a lot of them. Um, this is more of my my library down here. I do a more more reading in the off season, obviously. Uh, but this is more of my novels that I have down here. My library is more novels. And um, uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. I got a lot of uh, Le Carre. And I love the spy genre of uh, Len Dayton's. And there's some history in there. I even got uh, uh, 
Oh, I can't. That what's his name? Oh, Harry Potter. I would those books I enjoyed. I I burned through them in an off season around five years ago. You learn something new every day on Beyond. And that's Blue's Willie Live. Mays behind me right there too. So. Yeah. All right, so Keith, that Keith, was is not, Keith is not your average muggle, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Keith, how is the puzzle coming? That's from Ben. The puzzle um, is 2,000 pieces. I've never done one. I've done 1,000. And um, I'm around a quarter of the way through. I mean, you've got to get rid of the pieces. So you got to do the, the castle. I'm saving the sky with the clouds and the autumnal forest for the last and that's unfortunately where I'm at right now and I've been stymied for like three days I've got to figure out a way to tackle this you know like I'm having a hard time right now but I will not quit like an extra inning game on. like an extra inning game Keith. yeah that's right. <laughs> uh we will end on this one more last one for Keith is that a a cat door on the yes. of your office that's uh where Haji the people don't miss anything when, he has to, anything. when he's in a hurry, that's where he goes. <laughs> <laughs> this is all right, fellas. Well, listen, this uh, this really was great. It was just great to to see you guys again virtually. Talk to you guys. We've been at this again for almost an hour now, for fifty minutes. I know you only saw about a half hour of it live. We appreciate your questions. We uh, we will post the first twenty minutes at some point later today. So be on the lookout for that. Oh, we really enjoyed that as well. Every Thursday, 4 p.m. Next time, we promise we'll have it up and running right at 4 p.m. live. But Gary, Keith, Ron, myself for Beyond the Booth Live, and that is going to go as long as, as this goes, which, like I said before, hopefully it's not too much longer, but, um, but forever long it is, you will not have a hiatus from the four of us. <laughs> Good to see you all. all Good right, to bye. see you. Stay, stay safe, see please. You guys. Yes, please, stay safe.